This morning we're going to be talking about sheep. Uh, I know one of our young ladies is raising a sheep, and uh, I guess that makes her a girl shepherd, uh, but not quite in the same way that the biblical shepherds were and how they raise sheep for a living in Israel even today. The first shepherd in the Bible was named Abel. Adam and Eve's second son. The first son was Cain, and the second son was Abel. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, it tells that he was a keeper of sheep. And from that day till this, thousands and thousands of years later, people are still keeping sheep. We've still got shepherds. See, sheep need somebody to keep them. Left on their own, they don't do well. I mean, they don't. They're not the smartest animals in the world, and they need a shepherd. Well... They've had shepherds for all these thousands of years. And the need of the sheep hasn't changed, and the job of the shepherd really hasn't changed either. You go to Israel today, and you'll see shepherds going across the land, flocks of sheep, just wandering over the hillsides, nomads and wanderers, and just like they did for centuries. Oh, I imagine now some of those shepherds probably got a GPS recorder on you. But they don't let you know that. But the sheep can't read it, so they've got to have a shepherd still to tell them where they are and where they're going. But for the most part, it's just like it's been for centuries. Most of us who know a little bit about our Bible know that one of the most famous shepherds of all time was King David. He didn't start off as king. He was not born into a royal family. He was a shepherd when he was just a young fella and old enough to get out and take care of some sheep. That's what his daddy had him doing. And if you'll remember, he was out tending sheep when they came anointed him to become the king. He became the greatest king in Israel's history. And he wrote, which is probably one of the most famous passages in the Bible, the 23rd Psalm. I ask you to find that, and I think it's time for me to turn to it. <laughs> so we can read it together. The 23rd Psalm, we're just going to look at some of the verses, not all of them. We'll be going back and forth, so if we go to another passage, be ready to come back to the 23rd Psalm, okay? What does it say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside still waters. That's what a shepherd does. That's what a good shepherd does. He provides for the needs of his sheep, and he gives them a green pasture because he's got to have something to eat, and a stupid sheep can be on the wrong side of the hill where there's nothing but rocks and sand, and on the other side of the hill is green grass, but the shepherd knows it's there, so he leads them to the right pasture where they get plenty to eat. And if they don't find slow-moving water or water that's not moving real fast, they, they won't even drink it. He has to sometimes even make a little pool or a dam to make a calm, quiet pool so the sheep can drink the water. That's what David knew that. You see, he wrote this after he became king, but he knew that from his boyhood days. That's how a shepherd takes care of the sheep. And he says, I've got a shepherd. My shepherd, he's not like any other shepherd. Oh, he does his job, but he does it better than any other shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's, I'm not lacking for a thing. He wasn't saying I'm not lacking for anything because I'm the king of all Israel. No, he was saying I'm not lacking for anything because the Lord is my shepherd. If we were to take a survey today of people, and ask them the question, is there anything that you're lacking or anything that you're needing that you don't have? Most folks would say, oh, how much time have you got? I'll tell you. I, got, I can make you a list of all the stuff that I need that I don't have. Most people would do that. A lot of times the needs are not really needs, they're just wants. But when we get down to the needs, many people say, yeah, I do need something and I'm not having it provided. But then there'll be others say, no, I've got everything I need. They're not necessarily wealthy by the world standards, but they're content. They're saying, I really don't need anything. Oh, there's a lot of things I'd like to have, but no, as far as needs, no, I, all my needs are being met. And you say, well, great. How is that possible for you and not for the other guy that I talked to a little while ago? Very few of those people would say, all my needs are being met because the Lord is my shepherd. Not many would say, God's being good to me. He's the one that's blessed me. He's the one that's providing everything that I need. Not many people would. But I want to let you know something. If you're a Christian, and I mean in the truest definition of the word, 
the Lord is your shepherd. And you can echo the words of King David. I'm not lacking for a thing. I shall not want. He's got given me everything that I need. Now, the definition of a Christian you need to be careful about because a lot of people think of a Christian as just somebody who goes to church once in a while or claims to be a Christian or knows some Christians or whatever reason. You need to know that a Christian is somebody who has recognized at some point in their life that they have sinned against Almighty Holy God. They are guilty. Have you been there yet? If you got to that point in your life, you've made a first step in becoming a Christian. That doesn't save you. And you say, well, I'm sorry for my sins. That's a good second step. But that doesn't make you a Christian either. You hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is God's only begotten Son, and God loved you enough and everybody else enough that He sent His Son to die on a cross to pay for those sins so that God can count them as paid for and forgive you. Does that make you a Christian? No, that just makes you a knowledgeable sinner. See, we've got to get to the definition of what a real Christian is. A real Christian takes that information that Jesus died on the cross for my sins to pay for my sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He's alive in heaven right now, and one day he's coming again. And he's so alive right now in heaven. He's listening to everything that I'm saying. And when I say, dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me, he does it. That makes you a Christian. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and take over. That makes you a Christian. Now, if you're one of those, the Lord is your shepherd. And as your shepherd, he has a responsibility to take care of you like any good shepherd would. Provide the green pastures and the still waters. When we think about that, when we think about it as Christians, that the Lord is my shepherd, he's providing everything that I need, and he always will. We need to be reminded and be grateful. Spend time each day thanking Him for letting me put my feet on the floor today. Thank you, Lord, that I had a bed to sleep in last night. Thank you for the food that you've given me to eat. Thank you for the blessings. You're the shepherd. You're providing it for me. We need to be grateful. This same King David wrote something else in the 37th Psalm give you a chance to turn there. You're in the 23rd. If your Bible's like mine, it's just a few pages over. The 37th Psalm, the 25th verse. He's telling you he's not a young man anymore. He said, I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You say, how does that connect? It connects very simply. Righteous people today, listen to me, the righteous ones are the ones who have the Lord as their shepherd. The righteous ones are those who have confessed their sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. The righteous ones are those who have had every sin forgiven so that if they died right now, they'd be in heaven the next second. Are you one of the righteous ones? He said, the righteous ones, he said, I've never seen them Go hungry. <laughs> I've never seen him forsaken. The Lord does not forsake the righteous. When you become one of his and you've been saved, he doesn't forsake you. King David had never met Jesus. He was centuries in advance. And yet he understood that. The righteous ones are never going to be forsaken. He said, I've never seen that, and I've never seen God's seed, his descendants, his children, begging bread. Who are his children? Those of us who've been born again by the power of God and have been adopted into God's family because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. Those are his children. He said, they don't beg bread. God provides for them just like a shepherd would provide. King David understood a certain amount of this that the shepherd provides for the sheep. And if we ask him to become our Savior and become our shepherd, he performs a miracle. Now you need to get this part of it. And until we become one of his sheep, we're not sheep at all. Actually, we're goats. You say, wait, you're calling me a goat? Yep. If you're not saved, yeah. The Bible says we are until we're saved. And goats he puts on his left hand over here and the sheep on his right hand. They're his. 
A miracle takes place when you trust Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Not only are your sins forgiven, not only are you given a place into heaven, but you are born again. You are transformed into being something you were not before. Now you are a sheep. Now you can be one of his sheep. You couldn't be one of his sheep when you were a goat. Goats are goats. And most people are. Everybody is until we become one of his sheep. So he performs a wonderful miracle. And for those who become his sheep, he provides for us and he protects us. He protects us. Some of us have been aware that the Lord has protected us from certain things. Maybe you in one way or another. You ever have a close call on the freeway and say, Oh, I didn't see him. He almost got me. I had two or three times just yesterday. I don't know why those are such bad drivers out there. <laughs> We've all experienced something like that. We, we don't know how many times God has protected us from the evil that's in our world, maybe walking down a dark street. We don't know, but he protects his sheep. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 tells us some about the one that he protects us from. The devil is, oh, you're going to talk about the devil. You believe the devil's real? I sure do. <laughs> he's as real as you or me. Oh, yeah, he's real. What does he do? According to this, as a roaring lion, he's walking about seeking whom he may devour. He is wanting to eat. He is wanting to gobble up. You know what lions like to eat? Sheep. Can you imagine a hungry lion? You toss a sheep in there with him, what he's going to do? He's going to eat that sheep. That's what lions do. And he says the devil is like that. He's like a roaring lion. He's looking for sheep that he can devour, that he can gobble up. But as a Christian, I really don't have to worry about that. You see, because the Lord is my shepherd, he not only provides for his sheep, but he protects them. He will protect them. He will, oh, listen, the devil may nip on you a little, but he will not devour you. He can't because our shepherd is far greater than he is and he protects us. Go back to the 23rd Psalm. I ask you not to lose your spot. Go back to the 23rd Psalm. We want to look a little bit more there. Look at verse 23. There he says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. To restore my soul means that he brings me back. I was one place and I needed to be brought back. He restored my soul. He brings me back to God. I hope you understand that when we're born, we're born as innocent babies. That newborn baby is up there in the hospital right now. Everybody's going to say, oh, he's so beautiful. He looks like so-and-so. And it doesn't matter if it's an ugly baby or not. They, they say that's the most beautiful baby. That baby is beautiful. That baby hadn't had a chance to sin. Oh, he's got a sin nature, but he hasn't sinned yet. He's innocent. And it's that new baby, he's as close to God. Oh, he's close to God. Sin has not come into that baby's life in order to separate him from the close fellowship with Almighty God. But sin does come in. When we live any length of time at all, sin comes into our lives. And when it does, we get separated from God. There was a time in my life I was separated from God by my sin and I was lost. Completely separated from... But Jesus found me. <laughs> he found me. And, and he, right where I was, he, he knew where I was in my sinful life. He knew where I was and he found me and he brought me back. He restored my soul. He restored the relationship that sin had broken between me and Almighty Holy God. And it's the same for you if you've been saved. Listen to me. If he has not restored your soul yet, your soul, soul still needs restoring. And you say, well, what's my soul? It's you. It's all that you are. It's the real you. The you that's going to last forever, not this flesh. We're talking about the real you can get restored to God. Sin has separated you from Him, but 
great shepherd becomes your shepherd, the Lord Jesus becomes your shepherd, listen, he'll restore that relationship. All we have to do is when we realize what has happened and what sin has done from us, how we've gotten away from God, our, all we got to do is cry out to the Lord Jesus, our great shepherd, and he will hear our cry and he will restore us. He'll rescue us. He will save us. Use any term you want. That's what he does when he becomes our shepherd. Has he done that for you? I would think if he's done that for you, you would know it. You wouldn't say, well, I hope that someday he will. Well, at least you got some brain cells working if you're hoping. But it, has he done it? You need for him to, don't you? Because you see, if he doesn't, you're still separated from God. You're separated from God when? Now? And how long are you going to be separated from God? Forever if he doesn't restore your soul. There's another thing that he does when he talks about restoring your soul. Even after we're Christians, I don't know. You, you've, you've, if you've been a Christian length of time, you probably learned that you don't always walk on the exact path where the Lord wants you to walk. You just kind of get deviated off. I mean, if something attracts you or something blinds you to where or you're not paying attention to the Lord, something, and you're not walking exactly as you should, and you start getting a little bit away. And so the Lord, your shepherd, says, wait a minute, come on, come on, get back over here. Get back over here where you belong. He's a loving shepherd. I've noticed in my years that he gently nudges me back as he whispers, Alan, you've wandered off to the left, all right, and get back on the path. Come on, come on. And if I still ignore him, he nudges a little bit stronger. <laughs> hey! And if that doesn't work, do you ever notice a shepherd has a little shepherd crook, that big stick? The Lord is my shepherd. He knows how to use it. It hurts. But it doesn't matter if it hurts or not. What matters is do I get back on the path? Because you see, until I get back on the path as a Christian, I'm not walking with my Lord. I'm not living like a Christian. I don't act like I'm one of His sheep. And the world can't tell who I belong to. And they don't know how great He is. We need to get back on the path, Christian. Maybe your soul needs to be restored onto the right path. You, you haven't lost your salvation. You still belong to this great shepherd, but you got off the path. Come on back. Your shepherd will bring you back and lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now look at verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Oh, listen. We are all descending into a valley. Some of us have lived long enough to know that we used to be better than what we are now in a lot of ways. Our bodies were better than they are right now. Our thinking was better. Our eyesight was better. Our hearing was better. A lot of things were better, and we can really see the reality. We're descending into a valley, and there's shadows in that valley, and there's a shadow of death that waits in the valley. That's where we're heading. Every single one of us, that's just the, how we're built, how we're made. These bodies of flesh are not, temp, are not permanent, they're temporary. And we're descending into the valley of the shadow of death. And as the shadow of death comes over us, if the Lord is our shepherd, we can say like the psalmist did right there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though that's what I'm doing, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not afraid of death. Are you afraid of death? You don't have to be. If the Lord Jesus is your Savior and He's your shepherd and He's walking with you for the, through the valley of the shadow of death, you have nothing to fear. You see, that's what the shepherd said. Or he said, the Lord is with me. I will fear no evil. Thou art with me. He said, though I walk, that's what I'm doing. I'm in the process of walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He said, when death comes, I'm not going to be afraid of it. Why? You my shepherd are with me. No matter when that moment of death comes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, it'll matter to people who might miss me, but it doesn't matter to me because my shepherd's with me. I've got nothing to fear. He's greater than death. He's already conquered it. He spent three days and three nights in the earth, dead, and he came back to life. We have nothing to fear. 
He has the power to overcome death for himself. He has the power to come over, overcome death for me. And I'm not worried about it. That's what the psalmist understood, and he didn't understand. He didn't even know Jesus had already been crucified and resurrected because it hadn't happened yet. The Lord is with me and always shall be. If you can keep up with us, go quickly to Romans chapter 8. I want you to see this. Please turn. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. The thought is that he's always going to be with us. No matter how bad things get, no matter even when we come to death. Verse 38 in 8th chapter of Romans says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, Amen. our Lord. Amen. Wow! It doesn't matter what happens. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And I have Christ Jesus, and He has me. God's never going to stop loving me. I know he's not going to stop loving me because in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, he says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's good enough for me. So why should I be afraid of death? Death is just something that's going to happen. And I'm going to come out the other side, and guess who's still going to be with me? The one that went through the valley of the shadow of death with me. <laughs> the one who was there when my heart stopped beating is going to be there when I open my eyes in glory. Nothing to fear. He's always going to be there. Well, what happens after death? You didn't lose your place in Psalms, did you? <laughs> Psalm 23, verse 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what's going to happen. Hey, when you go through the valley of the shadow of death as a Christian and the Lord is with you, you've got nothing to fear because you know that on the other side of that, when you get there, He's got a place for you. Amen. Place in heaven. And it's, the psalmist described it this way, the house of the Lord. He's not talking about church. Uh -uh. No, no. He, he's talking about a mansion in glory in God's house. He said, that's where I'm going. He didn't say, did your Bible say maybe? <laughs> uh -uh. No, no, no. It's not maybe. It's absolutely certainly for sure. No doubt about it. I'm going to spend an eternity with him in heaven. I'm going to live with the Lord forever. It's certain if the Lord is our shepherd. We can trust our shepherd for our eternity as well as trusting him for the necessities of life for the protection that we need, our provisions, our protection. We can trust Him for our eternity if we'll just do it. That's my good shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, Jesus makes a promise to His sheep, and I do want you to turn to that. John chapter 10 Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. That's, that's the one King David was talking about. Jesus, I, I've been going back and forth saying Jesus and Lord. And John says, I, or quotes Jesus, where Jesus says, that I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and I know them mine. I know my sheep, they know me. They know me personally and I know everything there is to know about my sheep. Can you imagine a shepherd with the sheep roaming the hills after watching the birth of a lamb? Watching that little lamb take its first little steps and carrying it on, watching it grow up. He knows everything there is to know about that lamb. He has spent the lamb's life with that lamb. He knows everything about him. The Lord knows that about us. And you know what? That little lamb, he knows about the shepherd. He can tell his shepherd from any other shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, yeah, he said, I've got it. And Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and are known of mine. And here's his promise. He says, I lay down my life for my sheep. He not only knows our name, he intentionally laid his life down for us. When he let them rip the flesh off his back with that scourging whip, he was doing it for his sheep. When he let them drive the nails into his hands and his feet, and hang him on a cross. He did that for his sheep, for you and me. He said, I lay down my life for my sheep. They didn't do that to me. I let them do it. I allowed it to happen. I laid down my life for my sheep. I died on the cross for you. 
my sheep. Is he your shepherd? If he's not your shepherd, he did it for somebody else. Look at verse 28, same chapter. He said, well, from verse 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and they know I know them, and they follow me. That's kind of what he said earlier. I know my sheep, and I know them vine. He said, They not only know me, they know my voice, and they follow me. Verse 28 says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Because when you become one of his sheep, you've got his promise. I give every single one of my sheep eternal life. That means heaven. No end to it. It's not you missed this month's rent, so you're out you go. No, you're there forever. Eternal life. You'll never die. There's no sickness. There's no death there. Eternal life. He said, I give that to my sheep. And they'll never perish. Perish is the word that's used to describe what happens when somebody dies without Jesus. They spend an eternity paying for their sins in the fires of hell. He said, that's not going to happen to my sheep. Not even one of them. They shall never perish. And neither can any man pluck them out of my hand. He said, my sheep is right there. I got him. Nobody can take that sheep away from me. It's impossible. I don't know about you, but that verse and the next one tells me that when we're saved, we're saved forever. When we've been rescued, we've been rescued forever. We've been restored, we've been restored forever. When we become his sheep, we're his sheep forever. When he becomes our shepherd, he's our shepherd forever. What he gives, he doesn't take back. Is he your shepherd? If he is, he's given you eternal life and you'll never perish. But here the flip side of the coin, if you've not trusted him as your shepherd, you don't have eternal life and you're looking to perish. It's either one or the other. Oh my. The bottom line question is, is the Lord your shepherd? Remember what we read a moment ago, how he provides for his sheep? how he protects his sheep, how, how he leads us on paths of righteousness and gives us eternal life. He takes away the fear of death and will never perish and we can't be taken away from him. All that's wrapped up in being one of his sheep and him being our shepherd. What more important question could we ask than is the Lord your shepherd? most important answer you can give if it's true is yes. Oh, yes. You see, we become his sheep by volunteering, by request. That's the only way it happens. You don't say, well, I just hope so. Hope he'll look at me and say, well, that's not such an ugly little goat. I'll turn him into a sheep. No. No. We have to realize who we are and what we are and how far away from God we are and what we're missing out on by not having the Lord as our shepherd. Even realizing how much He loves us and how He's provided for us and how He's paid for us. And say, Dear Jesus, save me. Dear Jesus, please, I want you to become my shepherd. Please. I volunteer to be one of your sheep. Please become my shepherd. I surrender to you. Would you volunteer to do that today if you never have? Well, this would be a great day to volunteer to let the Lord Jesus be your shepherd. I guarantee if you do, tomorrow's going to be different from yesterday. Oh, it's going to be a lot different. And your forever is going to be a lot different too. Oh, yes. He can transform your life and change your forever. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will protect you. He'll pro everything. He just does it all. 
He'll even give you a place to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If he's your shepherd. The invitation's real easy to give today. If you've not already asked the Lord Jesus to be your Savior and your shepherd, do it. Just do it. He can hear you. You don't have to make a deal or make a promise or anything like that. Just say, Jesus, here I am. I'm a goat. I've been wild. I've been rebellious. I've broken your commandments. I'm not close to God. I'm not on my way to heaven. Change all that for me because I can't change it. And he will. We're going to give you a chance to pray a prayer or something like that right now. Repenting of your sins and trusting Jesus as your Savior. Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, for those that are here this morning that have never trusted Jesus completely as their Savior and their Lord and made Him their shepherd, volunteered to be a sheep, I hope, Lord, that they've heard the truth in such a way today that they'll say, I'm not going to wait a minute longer. I don't want to miss out on this. Oh, Father, speak to their hearts. While our heads are bowed, Lord, give them the faith that it takes to say, Oh, dear God, forgive me for not doing this sooner. Give them the faith to cry out, Dear Jesus, please become my Savior and be my shepherd. Forgive me. Take over. I'm trusting you like a sheep trusts the shepherd. Father, thank you because I know you're hearing anybody that's praying like that, if there's even one. Father, I know that there's some folks in here that would say, I know I've already done all of that, but I'm not walking on that path like I should. I need the shepherd to kind of nudge me back onto the right path again so I can get close to God again. I'm not as close as I used to be. I still belong to him. I'm just not as close as I was. And I want to get back. Forgive my sins. Correct my life. Bring me back close. Maybe they need to rededicate their life to you today. Father, maybe there's somebody here that needs to join this church. If so, tell them. And give them the faith to be obedient. Have your way now in Jesus' name. Amen.